Hey folks, it's Ray, DCRamRecord.com here, and today I've got 11 new things to know about the Polar Grit X GPS watch. Uh, now, if you're familiar with the Polar Vantage series, then a lot of that carries into this here. But the Grit X is not a replacement, according to Polar anyways, for the Vantage series. In fact, it sits more adjacent to it, though it does have more features than almost, it, we'll get into that in just a second. It's a little confusing. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna walk through the 11 things that are new about the Polar Grit X. I've also got a full in-depth written review that you can check out down the link down there. And that's where you get a lot of things like accuracy of the GPS and heart rate and all that kind of goodness. Uh, tons and tons of details there because it's basically the same as the Polar Vantage series on all the things I don't talk about here in this video. And before we get into those 11 things, things. I'll give you one freebie. The price, there are a bunch of different color options as well. In this case, I've got the like armyish green color option right here. Uh, but again, there's a bunch of different options out there. And this is the box. So with that, we'll dive into the very first feature on the list, which is the hill splitter. Now, as the name implies, it's about hills or climbing in some way, shape or form. It could be mountains or hills, doesn't really matter. It's about going up, but also about going down. Uh, and the way it works is that as you're running along and you start to go up an incline, once you hit about 10 meters or so in elevation gain, it'll automatically turn on as a data field. The data field is actually on the entire time, but it'll switch from showing you on basically flat ground to showing you on an incline. Uh, and at that point, it'll show you the split for that hill. In other words, it'll give you your time for the hill at that point, as well as your distance for that portion of the hill. Uh, so it doesn't know anything about the future. It's all about what you are from the start of the hill into wherever you are right then and there. And that's because, again, it doesn't depend on any sort of courses or routes. It's purely a point in time sort of thing. Now, what's cool, though, is if you go back down the hill, it'll also give you the same sort of information for descents. You go down the hill and you see how far you've gone down, and that's useful for folks that may be doing kind of longer trail runs where descents are almost just as important as going up the hill. Uh, now, where this is really sort of interesting is actually hill repeats. And I'd say it's more interesting for hill repeats than anything else. And that's because it shows you the count of the hills going up or down as you make each iteration. So I did a hill repeat session a couple of days ago, eight repeats, and it counted each one automatically for me uh, as I started the base. I didn't press any buttons at all, it just did it for me. Overall, it's a cool function, but I would say it's a little bit different than something like Garmin's Auto Climb or Garmin's Climb Pro features that are more designed for big Alps sort of running. This, I think, really suits itself best for hill repeats, as the name applies, because it doesn't require any course setup or anything like that, and it just automatically does it for you. But if you're going out and climbing in the Alps or somewhere where you're gaining thousands of feet on a given climb, uh, I'm not really sure this nails that because yes, it shows you point in time, but I kind of want to know how far to the top or how much more incline or how much more grade, sorry, to the top. And this doesn't really deliver there. Uh, still, I think that's a good start. I'd love to see it expanded down the road a bit more. Next on the list is the new 100 hour GPS battery life. Now, anytime, of course, any manufacturer, whether it's Polar or Coros or Garmin or Sunto, uh, says 100 hour plus GPS battery life, there's always a couple catches. Uh, and they generally fall into kind of three major buckets. One, you reduce the GPS track rate, in other words, how often often that GPS uh, track point updates. Two, you turn off things like heart rate sensors or other sort of sensors and stuff like that. Or three, you reduce the display refresh rate. Uh, and in this case, Polar does all three, depending on which setting you choose. And so the way it works is you choose a given sport profile, and within that, you go into the options, and you can see right there, power save settings. You select that, and you can change the GPS recording rate from one second to one minute to every two minutes, or simply off, but that's obviously not gonna give you GPS. And so once you choose one, for example, this every two minutes right there, that means they'll turn on the GPS for 15 seconds at a time, and then turn off the GPS for 105 seconds. In other words, every two minutes. Uh, and so it refreshes and cycles through that, so you'll get that GPS point, it turns it off, it saves battery. The next feature is the ability to turn off the heart rate, uh, so that'll save some battery as well. And then the final option is called screensaver. And what this does, it'll go ahead and reduce the refresh rate of the screen to save battery life even further. All those three in combination, depending on which combinations you choose, give you the battery life that you see right here on the screen, uh, which range from 40 hours with all the things on, uh, meaning all your features enabled, to 100 hours if you turn off a bunch of things and reduce the refresh rates. So next on the list, we've got number three, fuel-wise. But before that, if you're finding this video interesting or useful, just simply whack that like button at the bottom there. It really helps out this video and the channel quite a bit. But on the fuel-wise, the way you access that is the lower left-hand corner right there, and you go down until you find it fuel-wise fueling, uh, and then you'll see three options, smart carbs, manual carbs, or drink reminder. Uh, so if we go to smart carbs right here, the duration has to be an hour and a half or higher. Uh, and then from there, we choose the intensity zone of my activity. We'll go with just a Z3 right here, so a little bit higher than kind of long run pace. And then the carbs per serving that we want. Uh, and then right here, we'll choose next. At this point, it'll say I should be taking a total of 40 grams of carbs. Uh, it'll remind me roughly twice over the course of the run. Uh, and then it'll say carbs per serving 20 grams. 
I can go ahead and add or remove that. But I can also add down here a drink reminder on top of that. And I can use the touch screen, by the way, if I want to. There we go. And I can choose the drink reminder. Every 20 minutes is usually what I go with. I choose that right there. And then go down a little bit. You can see it recommends between half and one liter every 20 minutes uh, based on average sweat rate conditions and what it knows about me. And then from down there at the very bottom, I can choose use now. And once I do that, you'll see there's a new icon right there uh, that says the fuel wise is enabled. You can also just simply do a manual carb alert or a manual hydration alert as well. Keep in mind, this is not taking into account weather or anything like that. So it's kind of a bit static, uh, but it's certainly better than nothing. Now, the fourth feature on the list is actually almost in conjunction with the third feature on the list, but they are in two totally separate places on the watch, uh, which is the energy consumption bits. Now, it's going to show me calories, as you may have seen in the past. No real big surprise there, but it also shows me my carb breakdown, my protein, and a fat breakdown for this particular run. So this is the run I just completed 34 minutes ago, uh, and you can see right there, 1,000 calories. This is roughly an eight-mile run, a little less than that. Uh, I did about an hour. Uh, now, of course, this will change over time. So if you look at some of my other workouts here on the screen, the screenshots that you're seeing, you'll see the breakdown and consumption are different based on the intensities of those run. And you can see that in the smartphone app as well. Number five on the list is the addition of weather. Uh, you can now see a bit of a weather widget from the dashboard itself. Uh, so the same place that you would normally see things like your daily activity stats, etc. You can see the weather right there. I can go dive into that and now get a bit more detail on weather. Uh, I presume the high and the low for the day. Uh, rain, none. Great day. The wind speed, Holland. It was not a fun run from the wind standpoint. Uh, the wind direction, the humidity, the forecast for the rest of the day was with wind on the side as well as uh, you can see tomorrow. And as you go down further, it kind of condenses this a little bit more. So you can see Thursday uh, and that's basically it. So it's really simple. Just a quick glance at the weather on your wrist. This does require your phone nearby though to go ahead and grab that weather data. Next on the list is the addition of Commute integration. Uh, that allows you to go ahead and pull it route from Commute onto your watch. Now there's a few catches with that. Uh, first off, you have to have a Commute account, obviously. Uh, that's no big deal. You have to go ahead and ensure that your Commute account is linked to your Polar account, also no big deal. And then you have to ensure that the region that you are starting that workout in is unlocked on Commute. Commute allows one free region unlock, otherwise after that you have to pay for it. So once you've got that, you then go to Polar Flow, and then in Polar Flow, you'll go ahead and sync the routes in, and then you'll enable that particular route on the watch itself. Once you got that done, you go to your sport profile that you want, we'll just go with road running, uh, choose the upper left hand option right there, scroll on down until you find routes, and there we go. And you can see the little Commute icon, this is the Windmills Hill and Buildings route that I just completed uh, half an hour ago and then I can load that up into it. I can choose the start point or a midpoint if I want to on the route. I'm just going to go with the start point and then it loads it in. Now from an actual execution standpoint, this is basically just breadcrumb trails with notices that you're about to churn. Uh, so as you're running along, you'll see the line of the route itself. You'll see your dot on that route. Uh, and then as you approach a churn, you'll see a little arrow showing you which way you should churn, left or right or straight, uh, and then how far until that churn. Typically about 50 meters out if you're running, it'll give you that notification. And then you go ahead and complete the churn and that's the next thing. There's no underlying map data or road data or churn left on Maple Street or anything like that. It's just enhanced breadcrumb trail kind of routing. Still, if you've got your routes in commute and you use that, then it's not too shabby. Next on the list is a change to the optical heart rate sensor. So if you go ahead and flip over the back of the watch, and if I grab my Polar Vantage V watch right here and put them side by side, what you'll notice is, let's see if I can get this heart rate sensor to wake up there. The colors are different. Uh, so right there, you'll see that this is predominantly green on the Vantage V versus the Grit X is predominantly red and orange LEDs with a single green LED. Now, generally speaking, different color LEDs on optical heart rate sensors do two different things. One, they handle different skin tones differently, as one might expect. Uh, so reds and oranges tend to do better with darker skins. Greens tend to do better with lighter skin. They also tend to illuminate the skin at different depths better. So the way optical sensors work at a very high level uh, is that those color lights that you see on the bottom there, they broadcast light into your skin, into the blood capillaries, and then from there, the other dots there, the sensors, go ahead and read that. Uh, so by using different colored lights, you get potentially a better um, accuracy level. And that's usually what I see. Polar has some of the best accuracy uh, in their Vantage series watches, and this simply holds true as well. In addition to the color change, you'll also note that there are nine LEDs as opposed to 10. So in the past, they had 10 on here, but they only used nine. Now they're using all 10. Uh, so again, a minor bump. I haven't seen any major shifts though in accuracy. It seems just as accurate as the past on all the testing I've been doing. So that's probably a good thing. Okay, so next on the newness list here is the addition of the barometric altimeter. Uh, now you may be saying, hey, the Polar Vantage V has a had a barometric altimeter, and that's true, it did. 
but the Polar Vantage M did not. So the Grid-X does have a barometric altimeter. That is, of course, how it handles and does the hill splitter feature. Uh, it needs to have that level of detail or accuracy in order to get those hills split for you. It'll use the altimeter for a number of other things, notably running power. Uh, that is included in the Grid-X, so you don't need to have a separate sensor for that. Uh, as you're running along, you'll see your running power metrics, your running wattage, if you will, um, on the wrist right there. It's on the list is better buttons. Uh, this may sound like a trivial thing or a simple thing, but for the most part, I would say that the buttons on the Vantage V over here, Vantage series, were sort of non-awesome. Uh, they had just a little bit of like, they just, they weren't they were mushy a little bit. They weren't great. They were a little bit small, um, not ideal with gloves, but the grid is solid. I like these buttons. They're nice. They got like a clicky feel to it. Uh, it doesn't feel like mush, which is nice. There's also a slight bit of vibration that comes through this each time you press a button, a nice touch as well. Um, I don't believe that was on the Vantage series where I've managed to turn it off, but I don't get any vibrations when I use it on the Vantage. Uh, just a very nice, it's a very subtle thing that uh, it's a nice touch. Speaking about exterior things, the next one on the list is the removable bands. Uh, so they've gone to a standard 22 mil band right there versus the Vantage V did not have that. Uh, you'll see here, you can't remove this band. It is what it is. The Vantage M actually, despite being cheaper, did have removable bands, but this one right here, you just take this, you go ahead and pop it out like that. And if you can get it to cooperate, there we go pops out, get out of the way. Uh, and you can do the same for this side there. This means that you can go off and buy standard 22 mil straps on Amazon or whatever your favorite strap location is uh, and be compatible with this. Finally, last but not least on the list is the improved waterproof spec. If we grab this Vantage V back over here and flip it over, you'll see on the back, this is waterproof to 30 meters right there. Water resistant if you want, but either way, 30 meters uh, versus the Grit X is 100 meters. The Vantage V Titan was 50 meters. So that kind of sat in the middle there. Uh, but again, the standard Vantage V was only 30 meters. Uh, frankly, it's not going to matter. Uh, I mean, for the most part, waterproofing from a spec standpoint uh, is more than sufficient for anything you do here, whether it's swimming or otherwise. I've done tons of testing with that. I even have a waterproof test chamber here that I can put things in and go simulate down uh, pretty deep, actually, um, to go ahead and do that. And these days, sport watches just don't die based on waterproofing. Okay, there you go. A complete look at 11 new things on the Polar Grit X series. Uh, again, in my testing over the last Last while it's been doing pretty darn well. A couple of minor quirks and bugs, but things that are kind of you expect for early on uh, in the product cycle. Nothing that's a big deal. Nothing that's a showstopper. Uh, and I think that shows a lot of promise. I like to see where this goes from here on out. I don't expect any of these features at all to come to the Polar Vantage series. Uh, they made that clear earlier in the year on the Polar Vantage update site, saying that that's sort of the end of the road for this, um, which is a bit of a shame. But hopefully we'll see some sort of direct successor to the Vantage series down the road with all these features and maybe more features. I don't really know. Uh, but what I do know is if you do whack that like button right now, it does help this video out and the channel. And if you want more sports technology goodness, including more wearable stuff coming here very, very soon, as well as more non-wearable stuff, then whack that subscribe button at the bottom there or the ding-dong bell so you get notified the second something drops, just like this video right here. With that, thanks and have a good one.